welcome everyone. Uh, what a great day for you to be here in church. You get a sermon on living in a sensual world, on sermon on sex, and you get a financial report as well. It's due today. How good does it get, right? Some of you are not believers yet, are you? <laughs> Well, uh, just an update. Uh, our last update was in July uh, at our business meeting for our financial updates. We give one every quarter and try to keep you informed is where we're at. This year, our, our church passed a more aggressive budget than we have in the last couple of years because we desire to add a staff and, and some other things that went along with that. And so um, on top of that, our budgets are just a unified budget, but we have 12 different ones within the budget uh, because we know money ebbs and flows based on uh, whether it's summer or coming close to the first of the year and so on down the line. And I always didn't like that when I'd go to a church and I'd see their budget line and they, they were like $500,000 behind in September. And I go, well, no, you're not. Nobody, you just got to splice it out differently. But these are our our pretty accurate numbers now. And so we're about 10% down on our budget, as you'll see here, and that comes out to $80,000. And so I want to encourage you, thank you for your good giving. Our church is a great giving church. And so we thank you for that. And we have some things that uh, we desire to do this year. And I just encourage you to pray about your part in that. So thank you. Well, I want to begin today, I was thinking for an introduction, all I had to say was, uh, this is kind of Jesus' talk on sex, and that would be enough um, to get your attention, and I'm pretty sure it is, um, but it is a sermon on <clears throat> lust and adultery, cheating lies and cover-up, and it's an age-old story that we've seen, it's actually in the Bible, there's a story just like that in the Bible, and it concerns King David and Bathsheba, and many of you have read that. And this is not much different than today. I want to say right from the start, uh, I, I hear people all the time say, well, I just think our world's getting worse all the time. No, it's not. It's all, always been bad. As sin has always been sin, it's been just as vile as it was 2,000 years ago, Matter of fact, the Greeks and the Romans, they saw sex as nothing more than a biological function, much like eating and drinking, so that everything went in that society. There were no boundaries sexually whatsoever. And whereas we might feel like that is true in our society, and it, we are a sexualized society, everything is saturated with it, uh, nonetheless, uh, Jesus is going to be counterculture to us. And it will cause a little uncomfortableness for us at times as well. Jesus always did when he spoke. Uh, that's the wonderful thing about Jesus. Now, some of you here today, you're all in on the words of Jesus. If Jesus said it, you're going to do your best by means of the Spirit to follow it. Others, as we know, are, well, you think the church is a good idea. You love the community. You love the people. I uh, love most of what Jesus said, but you're not bought in all the way on all of it. I mean, there are things where you'll say just right out, well, I don't agree with that. And um, so you're here today as well. And some of you are here today, honestly, that um, you're a guest maybe, or you're visiting, or you're reconnecting uh, to a church maybe in a long time, and you would say, I I'm not sure I believe any of it just yet. Well, I hope that all of us will see some good current wisdom as we go through Jesus' words today as he talks about a thing that is very, very important to our society as well as to every society and what it means to be sexually pure and, uh, and honest in our lives before God. Now, I know in our society, and these are just a few thoughts rambling through my mind, because I hear these things and, and they're in our neighborhoods. Um, you know, I've, I've had people tell me that adultery is okay as long as it's, there's love involved. Well, because they went around to say, isn't that the highest ethic of the New Testament is that we would love one another? Um, and so I'm fulfilling that. Well... 
you can see how things get. We say things like, as long as it's consenting, as long as there's love, as long as no one gets hurt. Now, if you have any wisdom whatsoever, you know that when stuff like that happens, a lot of people get hurt. You might think it's private, but is there anything private? So Jesus knows that what he's going to talk about is a gift from God that can be abused by you and me and that we can actually hurt a lot of people by not following. So let me give you a review of where we're at. So if you have your Bibles open to Matthew 5, which is the Sermon on the Mount, You'll see that we started with this thing called the Beatitudes. Jesus is saying, I'm bringing the kingdom down to earth. I'm the king, and those who follow me are kingdom dwellers. They follow me. And I am bringing a kingdom that is different than the kind of kingdoms you're thinking about. It's not of this world, but it lives in this world. And so he told us those kinds of attitudes and mindsets that are in this new kingdom. And then he, uh, Pastor Sean led us in the next sermon about what kind of influence we were having in our society as salt and light. Last week, Jesus comes in in a transitional statement and he says, don't think that I've come to not fulfill the law of God. I have not come to abolish it, but fulfill it. And he went on to say that the kind of kingdom he brings is a kingdom that works from the inside out, that the outside law you never could keep and you didn't. And so I'm making a kingdom, I'll be a kingdom of priests that will live on this earth and they'll have the law of God written on their hearts by means of the Holy Spirit so for the first time you can keep the law. Now what he's going to do now, if you're looking at your Bibles, you'll see that there's six paragraphs one on murder, one on adultery, divorce, oaths, eye for eye, and love for enemies. And this is what Jesus is saying now. Right living looks like in the midst of the law, how I come to fulfill the law. He's taken six parts of the law that they would have known, not just the Ten Commandments. The laws were breaking up in sometimes prohibitions, commands, and permissions. And he's got a little flavor of all of those in here. And he is going to say what it means to have right living in the midst of this world. This is what the kingdom looks like in action. Now, due to time and our 10-week series, we're only doing two of these six. We're doing adultery today, and next week we'll be doing love for our enemies. And you're going to have a special treat next week. Um, uh, Pastor Nupanga is going to be here from the Congo and he is the president of the Congo Free Church right now, although he taught in our seminary in Bangui for um, probably 30 years. He's probably the most well-known pastor in our Congo Free Church. He's tremendous. I got to spend 12 hours in the back of a forerunner uh, going uh, from Bangui to Gem Gemina one day. Uh, it was 120 miles. It took us 12 hours. We only got stuck once. And uh, it was a wonderful trip, and he is just a delightful man, and you will uh, love to hear from him next week, so I encourage you in that. So take your Bibles, if you would, to Matthew 5, 27 to 30, four short verses, and Jesus says a lot in them. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. That is a command. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Well, what we're going to talk about today is what it means to navigate as kingdom dwellers. Maybe some of you are looking on and want to encourage you to see the good of what it could be for you to live in the kingdom as well. To navigate right living in a sensual world, a world that has always been around in that way, but is very obvious in our world today. 
Number one, we're to understand what is underneath all of it. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. Now, if you were here last week, I told you about the scribes and the Pharisees who wanted to do good for the people. He wanted, wanted to help them fulfill the law and follow the law. So what would they do with a command is they would narrow the command and what they would do with permissions is expand the permissions so that in essence you would feel good and say, hey, I've kept the law today. So here we come to the seventh commandment. You have heard that you should not commit adultery. So you know what that means. As far as the interpretation of the scribes, they narrowed it to mean very simply, if you did not have sex with your neighbor's spouse, you made it. You kept the command. And for even some of us here today, that, that one step, that would be good for you. That would be a step in the right direction, right? So that you were keeping the law. You pass the test. Interestingly enough, some rabbis would even interpret that so narrowly to mean that if you had sex with a single person, you still kept the law because that technically wasn't adultery because that person wasn't married. So Jesus says, I've come to fulfill the law, not abolish it. So he steps up and says, but I say to you, and you're gonna see that in all six paragraphs, there's a law and how you normally interpret it. And Jesus says, now I as the king in this new kingdom, I'm coming alongside of it and I'm gonna tell you what its original intent was. But I say to you, if you look lustfully upon a woman, you've already committed adultery in your heart or in his heart, it says here. So he comes along and he upholds, first and foremost, the sanctity of marriage, doesn't he? Because when Jesus speaks, his framework has always been Genesis 1 and 2 and what the law would say, what we call the Pentateuch, the first five books of our Bible. And he says, as well, he upholds sexual purity for all people. And what he does is exposes what was original intent of the command was to expose the heart, <laughs> that I can never quite measure up to the command, that I always fail. That's what happened to Israel. And so he says, so the look. So there's two words in the Greek here. One looks and the other for desire. Looks lustfully at a woman. So obviously, this illustration is given for a man, isn't it? And uh, so half of you here today are going, well, this sermon doesn't apply to me. Well, it does because of the intent of the law here, but it is, interestingly enough, pointed at a man and his heart, and so we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So what it's not talking about here is that you're walking along and you see a beautiful mountain and you go, oh, that's a beautiful mountain. Or you see a beautiful woman and oh, that's a beautiful woman. Or you see a beautiful man, oh, that's a beautiful man. I was with my wife once and, and Brad Pitt was on the screen and I go, man, I hate him. He's such a beautiful man. She didn't disagree. <laughs> and that's okay. Because she looked and she saw but what Jesus said is you look and you see and you stare and you see and want something else, looking with desire, lustfully. It's in the present tense, meaning continually gazing. And what Jesus is saying here is it, there's a choice after the notice. There's a choice after the notice. And when you make that choice towards looking lustfully, you, a lot of things fall into place underneath that of a mindset that in essence, what Jesus would say, sinned already, you've already broken the law. The stare here is that fuel, that which fuels sexual desire. You see something, you don't just appreciate it, but you want it. You want it for yourself. 
You want the pleasure for yourself. And in essence, Jesus says that dehumanizes people. That makes them an object. And it violates all the ethics of the kingdom, he says. That, that's, the law was meant to expose that. And that's exactly what I want you to see, he says. It fractures everything and it degrades a person. And almost every woman that I've talked to in some kind of situation like this would say that they have experienced the stare. And they know it. They don't know what it feels like. And what Jesus is saying is then, who we are on the inside is who we are. Whether woman or man, I don't want to let the women off the hook as well because one of my staff members was telling me a story this week of not inside this church, but another connection they have from another church of a woman that they knew who was counseling a woman who was struggling in her faith walk because of her sexuality. She was attracted to other men besides her husband, and she was struggling with that. So we know that this is true. As a matter of fact, when Paul talks about it, he includes everyone and he says in Ephesians 5, there shouldn't be a hint, I love that word hint, of sexual immorality in the church. Not a hint. Uh, that's a pretty high bar, isn't it? Not a hint. Because Jesus says the desires and longings come from within in the heart. And though it's a, it's a word to all of us, it's interesting that he says his heart here because a lot of times we think that what's private is private and what's on my screen is on my screen and no one else sees it and it doesn't affect anybody else. But I think there's interesting the way that Jesus presents here and the fact that most women have never utilized or weaponized sexuality in that way, but man has in war and in other ways used as a tool of violence. And what it happens is, is it creates victims on every, la uh, every level. And our society caters to our sexual lust. We just have to be honest about it. And one of the biggest caterers is the porn industry. Barna just came out with a recent research and it's designed to be a study for the church as well. It's 61% of all American adults use pornography regularly. And we know that those statistics fly over to the church as well. And I, and I would say for all of you looking on, if you're not in the church or you're a guest here today, that we're all hypocrites here. You know, I, we get that all the time. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. So you have this in your church too. We are, the, but we're honest hypocrites. That's the reason we're here. We want to get help. And I hope that's true for all of us in this particular area. And this, this particular area has no age limits, as we see. If you have eyes, Jesus is talking to you. <laughs> if you have hands, Jesus is talking to you. It's going to be interesting. But this, as we know, and I, I view this in, in a lot of ways that a lot of what we've seen in our society over the last 25, 30 years has come from the foundation of the porn, porn industry in our society. It's, it's over a billion dollar industry every year in America. And, and, and I've had people tell me that, you know, it's, it's private. I don't let it go anywhere and it's between me and my screen, so to speak. And let me tell you, it's not because everyone on the screen is a victim. And Every study has shown that it rewires the brain as you watch regularly to where even in your daily conversations, in your daily interaction with women and men, it changes the way you view them. And yes, it's subtle, but it's real. And it's one of those things that why everything is so acceptable in our society. And like I say, uh, our society maybe. All of this stuff was going on. It just wasn't so prevalent like it was in Greek and Roman society. But now because of our communication and internet and everything, everything is out in the open. But it's one of those 
things that get into your brain, a brain worm, an addiction that never gets enough. It starts just here and then it just keeps expanding. It's why even today there are some places that are talking about lowering consent laws or not having any consent laws whatsoever for minors. That's an expansion of this horrible worm in people's brains. And it's led, it's been said now that there are more slaves in our world today than there ever has been. And a lot of that is because of the sex trafficking industry. And Jesus is saying, I want this, the new kingdom to be safe for everyone. That's the way it was meant. A new heart, a new covenant, a new way of living to where loving God and your neighbor are seamless and whole for all people. So what Jesus is doing here, secondly, I believe, is he's guarding what is good. In the context of a covenant, the scripture teaches that sexuality is a great gift. Covenant of marriage is meant for the good of mankind. And Jesus takes, if you follow Jesus' teaching through the scriptures, you will recognize that he consistently goes back to Genesis 1 and 2 and the law to teach us the good that that was meant for man to be. That marriage was meant to reflect the image of God, yet we were shareholders in creation in essence. We were rulers with him. And we were a reflection of his image. And this intimacy, this unification of a male and a female in the marriage bond was then meant to create life and continue on for humanity. And Paul would say, this is such a high bar for us as a church. And not only shouldn't there be a hint, but you need to recognize that when you sin sexually, it's unlike any other sin, Paul says. Because it's a sin against your own body. It's a sin against your own humanity. It degrades you and devalues you when you don't follow God's design. And Jesus wants the very best for us. And so the Bible teaches very freely that sex is God's idea. It's a good gift and everything along with it. We're not prudes, but we recognize that when it leaves the covenant relationship, it can be abused and misused. As a matter of fact, I learned something new this week in my study, and I'm surprised I'd never read it before, uh, but I did a couple double checks on it, and it's actually true. There's seven feasts, major feasts that Israel uh, celebrates every year. And with each one of those, they read certain books of the Bible with it. Purim, they read Esther and so on down the line. On the Passover feast, and I've seen Passover feasts and all that sort of stuff, and we've had them here before, what happens on that night and everything. What I didn't realize was, is they also read the Song of Songs on Passover. Now, for those of you that know your Bibles just a little bit, some of your King James Version calls it the Song of Solomon, but it's actually the Song of Songs, and it is an erotic poem in the Old Testament. Don't go to it right now, but it's on page 633 in my Bible, if you have my Bible. Um, it's an erotic poem celebrating the love between a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. And uh, a lot of comparisons in there. We've, uh, it's compared to fire and uh, a lot of great things in there. And it's read, I, I tried to try to figure out why do you read that at Passover, the celebration of redemption from Israel and the Exodus experience. And it was God's consistent love for his people and is meant to symbolize part of that particular book. I thought this is, pretty wild, but you'll have to go read that later. It'll uh, be interesting for you. Um, but Jesus is saying very simply that when you take the good gift out of the good covenant that I've given to you, it can be misused and be uh, bad for people. I, I, thought, I thought about this this week. If you give yourself to adultery or sex outside of marriage, give yourself physically, um, 
but you don't give yourself the rest of the way. Paul says you devalue yourself if you don't also get understood spiritually and morally and mentally, um, emotionally. You give yourself totally. That was what the covenant was meant to be so that it could be a celebration. It could be a good gift that was given. But when you have sex outside of the covenant, you leave yourself vulnerable. And I have seen this over and over and over again, how vulnerable it leaves people financially, emotionally, spiritually, open physically, uh, but not in a covenant way that was meant for your good. And when you do that, you act as a consumer. You act as if the world is for you. You act as if the other person is an object and you, in essence, degrade that relationship. I think that's why... um, You know, we're not prudes, but we say, for good wisdom, Jesus wants our very best. Jesus cares about the human uh, position that we all find ourselves in, and he wants freedom and life for us to be right living in the kingdom of God. So you've been waiting for me to get to verse 29 and bring out the axes. I want to tell you that this is Jesus in these six paragraphs, most intense language and teaching of all of these sections. Because it's a call for purity and holiness among the church. This surpassing righteousness that is urgent for the kingdom of God to have. You can't manage your way through this. It takes radical action, Jesus says. So if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. What Jesus is saying here is it's drastic and serious of how we should take action in dealing with sin in our life. This is obviously a very big deal to Jesus. And no, let's just put an end to it right now. Mutilation will not cleanse a heart. I was thinking about this this week and I tried to be a funny way because I knew there'd be some somberness here today. You know, but uh, that, if, that if mutilation worked, I'd probably be up here preaching and everybody just see a little toe. Just let that sink in for a minute, will you? <laughs> uh, so, so in some ways, the look has to do with the eye, right? The vision of your person. But if it's looking, why just the right eye? That's our strong eye for most right-handed people, which the majority of the world is. Um, and what about your right hand? Well, adultery. Cut it off. The right hand is what's used for theft. You're stealing what doesn't belong to you when you do that. And he says, interestingly enough, why we know that Jesus wasn't talking about going out and getting an ax and mutilating yourself, which would take a great sense of will, wouldn't it? Because there's obviously one part that's missing there that he didn't talk about. Which we would all jump to the conclusion that could fix the problem, wouldn't it? No. No. It won't. Because Jesus said this sin has to be dealt with radically, but from the inside out. The core is the heart. And a lot of us think, well, no one saw it. No one got hurt by it. It was just a private moment. But it does have social consequence. You can be proud that you only watch PG movies, but you can have an X-rated thought life in the midst of it. You can be faithful physically to your spouse or if you're single to go into marriage without having sex with anybody and still have a fantasy life. And Jesus is talking about that. And yes, he knows we all fall short. And what he's saying is we need to be renewed and revitalized by the kingdom that I'm bringing But he says, you have to get serious about the traps that keep us in bondage here. He says, for goodness sakes, to not deal with this 
It's like throwing yourself into hell. Like to go there willfully, subtly. Those are the words he uses there. And in that day, they could kind of see hell. The word used here is Gehenna, which was the name of a place outside of Jerusalem that burned continuously where they brought all the garbage, but they also brought in the Roman era children there, babies. They were burned. And he says, in essence, that if you don't radically deal with sin in your life, especially sexual sin, which is a sin against your own self, that in essence, you're throwing yourself into a black hole and you're just not going to get out. Yes, it can result in eternal damnation, but right now it damns you as well. It'll ruin you. And he puts out this vision of there's two ways for you to live. There's a kingdom way and there's a kingdom opposed to God's rule way. And you have choices when it comes to this. I love what Martin Luther said about this passage and I'm gonna quote it to you in my own words so that you understand it. He says, I can't stop a bird from flying over my head and pooping in my hair. That's a disher translation, but that's exactly what he said. He said, but I can stop him from making a nest in my hair. And that's what Jesus is calling us to do here. Let's not get comfortable in it. We need to fight against it. One of my staff was talking about the Grand Canyon today. Oh, it's wonderful. I remember when we took our kids to the Grand Canyon, the boys were a little rambunctious at the time and mom was nervous. Cause you know, there's a big drop on that Canyon, like a mile. And the boys would like to play right up against it and tease mom like they were gonna fall off or whatever. And they would do that in areas where maybe there was like a three foot drop off or whatever. And um, I never felt like my wife on vacation never felt better than to leave a place than the Grand Canyon because the kids were a little wild at the time. But you know what they do in areas where the people are in the Grand Canyon, what do they do? They put up rails so you feel a little like you're not going to drop in the hole. And I think that's what Jesus is asking us to do. So let me give you a few suggestions of what I think we could move towards in this area when it comes to right living in our sensual world. And it is a sensual world. Number one, do an audit for yourself. I mean, do you have a true understanding of foundation like Jesus talked about, of foundational goodness of marriage and who we are as people of God in the midst of that? Even if you're not married. That it's a good to be celebrated, that God is good. Maybe we don't celebrate Passover, but maybe you can read the Song of Songs annually just like they do as well. I don't know. But it's, it's a good given to us by God for our good. But are we misusing it in any way? Take an audit of the things that you do through your day and through your week. Are they the things that will renew your mind or will they rewire your mind? to think different thoughts. Secondly, I'd say then be honest with and about Jesus. If there's areas where you haven't followed him, I mean, Jesus knows it. This, Jesus says this is urgent. I mean, for goodness sakes. He's metaphorically taking out the axis here. So the Bible over and over again tells us to get rid of those things that will keep us away from righteous living. And as I was thinking about that, how Jesus talks about either go to hell or be thrown into hell, how the correspondence from the Old Testament where the writers say that the heart is the wellspring of life, it's where all the goodness flows from. But the opposite can be true too. It can take you to a black hole. So the question is, what are you feeding? What's the wellspring of your life? And notice how personal this is. It's your hand. It's your eye. It's that member of your body that can ruin you and bring you into the black hole. 
What he's saying is there is hope in the kingdom to be remade in this way. Third, and I'll just remind you of what other passages will say, that when it comes to this, interestingly enough, Song of Songs relates this to fire. Fire is good when it's maintained right. In your house, you probably used your heater this week. In your house, it's good. When fire gets out of line, it's devastating. And the New Testament teaches that we should flee the evil desires and pursue righteousness, 2 Timothy 2. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, flee sexual immorality because all other sins are outside of the body. This one sins against your own self. And so don't try to manage your way out of this. You won't have the ability to do that. You have to run away. You have to get out of it. You have to stop. And in order for some of us to do that, you'll probably have to open up where you have been secretive. What is open can be healed. And probably for any of us who've struggled with this and everyone has struggled in some way and we've all sinned and it all comes from our hearts. Tell someone. This is in our, our rooted curriculum where we come together and we repent and tell our sins to one another so that we can be healed, the Bible says. And when we keep that secret and private, we can't find healing with it. And Probably some of you, if you're newer here, maybe there's no one in the community that you know well enough, I want you to take some steps anyhow because it will keep you away from participating in the kind of community that you're meant to be in here as well. And you'll shy away from it. So the questions become, do you, do you want to pursue purity in this area? And if you do, you probably need support, especially depending on where you're at with it. And um, for some of you, you need someone to talk to about healing of because someone's betrayed you in a very harsh way. Someone else sinned against you. It might have been when you were a child. It might have been when you were an adult. Maybe others you have, God has given you strength and fortitude to walk along with others. And I want to encourage wherever you're at in this journey to take a step. Um, I really feel that the church would be so much more a stronger presence if we were, if we were pure in this area as God calls us to be. And so I want to challenge all of us um, to get on a journey towards purity and healing in our lives regardless of how that's touched you. And what we've done this week is we've provided a way for you to do that. If you go to our care ministries on the website, there'll be two buttons there, one for men and one for women. These will be confidential with Pastor Matt and Brenda. She'll take the women and Matt will take the men. And then there are links as well to help you get there on the bottom of your sermon notes for care ministries. You can go there. And if you would like someone to start walking alongside of you. This is the way. Maybe you need some resources and we want to be able to, to help you walk in this. Because Jesus says it's a big deal. So let's not minimize it with our own little missteps and acknowledge what it really is. It keeps us away from God's fullness and wholeness in our hearts and lives. So I want to encourage you in that. And for all of us, some of you have burdens on your hearts related to this topic. Even though you might not personally struggle with sexual integrity, but you have a heart for people in your life that you know do, or people in our church to find freedom in this way. Whatever the reason for that, we're going to have a short 10-minute prayer time around here today. Pastor Matt will lead that um, for guided prayer up front on this particular sub subject. You can come and pray quietly or out loud. It 
Could be that um, a long time ago you were a victim of something and, and God just is opening that up a little bit so that you can heal. Whatever the, whatever the case, uh, you're invited to come and pray at the end of this service. So let's bow together in a word of prayer. Gracious Lord, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep and we know that in our society that many have been hurt by this particular passage of scripture that talks about this kind of sin. So Lord, we want your grace and your goodness to come to all of us, to be members of that kingdom that shows the goodness of God and the grace of God in this world. So Lord, we, we pray that you would move in our hearts and lives, that you would, by means of your spirit, speak to each one of us today and uh, areas where we've allowed our guard down, where we haven't fled like we should. Would you give us, by means of your spirit, the ability to open our hearts and lives to you and maybe to someone else to find hope and healing in the midst of of falling short sometimes, as we all do. So Lord, we just uh, give you praise for your goodness and your word to us and your great invitation to us to be part of a kingdom uh, where your goodness is seen. And we'll give you all the praise for that in Jesus' name. Amen.